Hey everybody, it's another Talk and Draw with uh, Patrick Scullin and Travis Hansen, and today our special guest, Eddie Pittman. And uh, we're really excited to have him with us today and share his, his knowledge and techniques. Um, Eddie has an extensive background as a cartoonist, uh, Disney animator. He has a, his own personal series, Red's Planet. He's been working on a graphic novel series for many years. Which is and, fantastic. Yeah. yeah thanks. And uh, he even worked on a little thing called, uh, what was it, Phineas and somebody? Fin Phineas and, um, oh, I forget that oh. one. Um, <laughs> Phineas and Ferb. Ferb, yeah. there it is. That's, well, that's the one I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, Eddie has a lot of experience and has uh, seen a lot of things in his day. And so we're glad to have him um, share his knowledge with us and discuss drawing. While today we're going to talk about uh, creating stories and some of the stuff that goes into creating good stories <laughs> entertaining stories oh, right? oh wait a minute you didn't tell me that so i <laughs> time for me oh. to leave oh well in that case uh then we're going to talk about uh stories <laughs> good or bad there you go the good bad and the ugly um and uh travis you're going to introduce our drawing subject today so um, our drawing subject today is very much uh, in par with uh, Eddie's current book, Red's Planet. We're going to draw some aliens. Nice. And uh, however we want to draw them, and we're going to have a little bit of fun with that. So uh, we're ready to, to jump into that screen, shall we? Yeah. So go ahead, Travis. And then um, while, uh, while you're getting yourself set up there, one of the first questions I had for us as a group is um, first... I, I think a lot of people, um, well, let me back up. I think as artists, we don't always feel comfort, uh, confident or com comfortable writing. And uh, as storytellers, creative storytellers, sometimes we have to, to learn how to write, uh, to create mm -hmm. stories for our characters. So I was just wondering if you could each kind of describe your writing process, how that goes into uh, creating your art. Well, um, for me, to start off with, it would be very much, uh, I always liked the way that Jeff Smith did his, he would just storyboard his, his books and, uh, you know, draw different pictures around them and squares and then add the text and go along. And I'm pretty much the same way. I'm very visual. Um, the more I can see the image, the easier it is for me to write the, the story around it. It's kind of like what I see in my mind is a, is a movie. And I'm just basically the director putting the scenes together. Okay. So it's kind of like, have you guys heard of the Marvel method? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're your own Marvel method. You're the Travis method. I don't know. We'll see. What about you, Ed? Well, I think that's, you know, um, in the beginning, it's, it's trying to get all those ideas to uh, come together. I think um, for me, it's, you know, in animation, it's what we call the, the, uh, the blue sky, uh, time of just trying to come up with whatever ideas you have. Uh, you don't put those restrictions uh, on your ideas. You don't have judgment on it. You don't say, well, that's kind of silly or someone's already done that. You just start creating. There's plenty of time after you've started working on your ideas to refine them and, and start to ask the tough questions of um, how can I make this better? In the beginning, it's just great, I think, to create and not get bogged down with, you know, with, with too much self-judgment. So in that process, do you, um, uh, do you like actually have a notebook? Do you, what's, yeah. uh, yeah, that's, that's really the, know. yeah, that's, that was the, the tough thing for me was, uh, was writing it down. Cause I'm a, I'm a terrific daydream dreamer. I, uh, I, I majored in that in college. Um, <laughs> it was, but there's a, you know, there's a, there is a, uh, there's a line between um, uh, daydreaming and actually creating. You've, you've got to start writing things down. And, and a lot of times you forget the things you've daydreamed. Um, so I, I keep a, uh, I keep a notebook, but I, but I also keep a, a, a Scrivener um, file. So uh, I used to use, use Evernote, but I've come to like using the program Scrivener, which is a, a writing program. Um, I don't know. Have you guys used that? I actually just use oh. my notes in mm -hmm. uh, my iPhone 
especially mm -hmm. because I'm doing with life of the party, um, the way that's set up, it's more of a, a, a moment in time. So I just take different things and, and, and write them as a, as, you know, like just a quick concept. But right. when I'm sketching, like when I'm putting the bean together or any of the other books, I actually have sketchbooks that are dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I always carry at least one or two around in my backpack and, and which seems to always make it a little bit heavier, but you never know, like when that concept's going to hit you or that idea and you want to grab it the minute it shows up. Mm -hmm. That's always been my problem is I get ideas at very inconvenient times. So, um, I always think of that Seinfeld episode where he wakes up in the morning and he can't remember his great idea and he tried to write it down on his nightstands. You guys see that episode and he couldn't remember his, his best joke or he, right. what he, what he wrote was gibberish the next morning. So, um, I've, I've tried Evernote. I haven't tried the, is it Scribner? You said Scribner. Yeah. Scribner. Um, it's, um, it is, uh, I'm sorry guys. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm getting bogged down here. So I'm closing out some, some programs. Um, oh, no so, problem. Yeah, um, it's what I like about it is everything's self-contained. It's a very simple uh, writing program, but um, uh, you can keep files inside it and images, and so everything's in that. And you can you can sync it on your uh, Dropbox. Oh, so okay. I can open it on on my phone. I can open it on uh, uh, my iPad or or on my desktop. So, oh, that's convenient. Uh, yeah. I've used Google Docs that way too, actually, a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess in terms of my process, what, what I typically will do is, um, I try to write a little tagline for myself for that little, uh, what they call it? The log line to oh, yeah. kind of capture what my little story idea is. And then mm -hmm. if I have time, I'll try to flesh it out into an outline. But later on, uh, I even get into, it's a, it's a really kind of OCD thing, but I even get into creating a script for myself where. I uh, write panels and I write, I write it out pretty, pretty literally what I want it to be because, because of the fact that I think I just will forget it if I don't write it down mm -hmm. that way. Well, That's a great idea. I have found too, for me that sometimes works or helps is um, writing the ending first, having a direction to go to, and then just let the story kind of find itself towards that ending. That way I'm at least anchored to it. Otherwise, uh, my fear is that when I'm creating a s series or such, I'm going to get into a, Rob a Robert Jordan situation where it just goes on and on and on and on. And I like to have closure and ending. And, and that's something that, that even with like the bean, I have an ending. I just haven't got there yet. But at least it's given me an anchor point to, to move towards. I think that's a really good idea um, in terms of story pacing to start with the end. And then, well, even if it's just a scene, I mean, I know the yeah. end scene, um, and I think that's that's what was important for me was creating that end scene. So, for all of your longtime readers, spoil the ending right now, Travis. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> How about you, Eddie? Do you have a an ending for Red's Planet? I do, and I'm uh, working on it right now. Um, it's uh, the third book in the series and trying to, we're quite behind on the deadline, but um, you know, uh, it'll, it'll get finished eventually. So what was the uh, inspiration to, to do red? Boy, that's always the, uh, that's always the question, isn't it? Uh, it's, uh, several different things. I think, you know, ultimately, now, ideas are funny. Ideas are like um, kind of like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that you um, uh, you know that you find laying around, and you start putting them together, and you go, "Oh, this would this is really cool. This is interesting." And um, but you don't have the uh, you know you don't have the the box with the beautiful picture on there to know what you're actually creating. Um, you just keep finding pieces and seeing where they fit in, and at some point, you think you know what the picture is. But then it always surprises you in the end when you get all the pieces together or close, you go, wow, this is nothing like what I thought it was going to be. And I think creating ideas are a lot like that. So 
Um, for me, it was several different things. It was, um, I was inspired by some uh, shows that were, were, that I saw in development back in the early 2000s about a couple little kids in space. Um, and that's, that kind of gave me the idea of, it would be fun to do something um, on another planet. And I've always been a big Pogo fan. And I thought, you know, it'd be fun to do like Pogo in space with some really crazy characters. Um, Walt Kelly sure uh, influenced a lot of illustrators with his Yeah, writing. he really did. And especially those of us who are, you know, artists first. Um, we, you know, his draftsmanship was amazing. And uh, his ink work was so beautiful. I get, it's funny, I get compared to Jeff Smith a lot. Um, but the truth is, Jeff and I have just both had the same influences. I can see that. So, same source code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, Bone influenced me in the sense of, um, oh, look, someone's doing something I always wanted to do. But it, was, it wasn't something that inspired me to, to create a certain style. Want to switch screens? Yeah. Um, before we do, though, Trav, just just kind of uh, cap what uh, you've been doing there. Oh, I got to have an alien in a spaceship flying 100 miles an hour. Well, probably a little bit more than that. Some <laughs> going meteors through flying around. Yeah, going through a little asteroid belt, which, you know, I find to be really uh, comical because uh, you you know, you watch it and they, they, all the rocks are so close together. But in reality, uh, I think flying through an asteroid belt, uh, you'd be lucky to <laughs> get close never, to any. Never tell me the odds, right? That's right. Never tell the <laughs> odds. So, well, let's switch screens and uh, jump over to Eddie. So I'm all right. Well, I think, uh, I think everyone's going to be very um, disappointed. So, uh, uh, be no, let me, I'll show you. Uh, <laughs> do you have me so far? Oh yeah, yeah. we got you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I like to start a lot of times in the early stages of, of actually um, sketching out um, shapes, trying to find um, some interesting shapes to start building my characters around. Um, gives me a little more, um, starting with that, um, I, I start to, I get, I, I think of the broader ideas of, of what creates the character. I'm working on some characters right now um, that are kind of these alien thugs. They're, um, I'm going to change this. They're, um, they're kind of the henchmen of a, uh, of a uh, alien mob boss who's stuck here on earth. So I'm kind of thinking of those kind of thug kind of um, shapes, you know, the big, upper upper body and how can I take those so this is less illustration and more just development so that sounds like a lot though. like the uh kind of the I don't know what you call it but kind of an animator's way of planning out the silhouette and making yeah it a character yeah. in itself silhouettes are really important in creating characters because it helps us to create characters who are um iconic we can look at those shapes and tell a lot about what that character is plus it it um it helps us create characters that that um have a have visual contrast to one another so they don't all look the same um sometimes it's okay i mean the charm of peanuts is all those kids are the same exact shape but uh you know in south park right that's yeah. Right. Of, but um, when we're creating um, characters for animation, we're looking for something that has uh, an immediate visual um, identity. I would never have thought to approach it like that. You know, the other fun thing is it, it helps to um, break up the monotony or, and, and sometimes gives you ideas that you wouldn't have thought of because you're um you're you're playing with shapes rather than um actual features so it, so you don't fall back into the same muscle memory of your um you know that your hand has developed over the years same faces same features that's really cool 
So let me ask you a question, a little side question, a little bit with the storytelling and such. You know, uh, I don't think most people realize you, uh, when you worked for Phineas and Ferb or when you worked mm -hmm. on Phineas and Ferb, your main, your main uh, job was, was writing, right? Well, that was half my job. We, Phineas and Ferb was one of those shows that, that it was a, a storyboard driven show. So we had a staff of writers, some amazing writers. And, but what they would do is they would write a, um, a synopsis of what our episode would be. And then it would get passed down to the, the storyboard slash writers. And that's what I was. So there was always a, a team of a, a couple of writers on each episode. And um, uh, we would take that synopsis and we would start fleshing it out, come up with some um, ideas of our own. And a lot of times, by the time we finished with it, um, it didn't resemble anything that we started with. Um, uh, we just took it in a different direction and we were given that, um, that freedom from uh, uh, Dan Pavenmeyer and, and uh, uh, Jeff Swampy Marsh um, to do whatever, you know, whatever it took to make it a really good episode. So, you know, having that experience, and I know that you had started Red's Planet before you worked on, mm -hmm. on Phineas, did that change any of how you approached uh, Red's Planet in the future. Oh, it did. Because yeah. I mean, if you look at the the shows on Phineas and Ferb, they are so well crafted, and mm. the humor is so point on at at so many different levels. It's great for an adult as well as for a kid. You know, yeah. there's just yeah. something about it. And I, I'm just curious, how much did that influence your future writing on Red? You know, it was. Um... It influenced it quite a bit. I, I learned so much from both Dan and Swampy, as as well as all the other uh, um, writers and artists on the show. Um, you know, uh, Swampy really taught me um, brevity. I don't know how many times he, you know, sat there and and told me to, you know, cut it, cut it, stop. You can say that in much fewer words. You don't have to say that much, right? Um, so. Uh, especially in writing dialogue, um, just say it as simply as you can, and, um, and no no need to repeat yourself. So, and I'm I'm pretty verbose in my comic, but it's uh, it it I think created a better editor in me. Of, um, so, and, and I'm sure there are other things as well I'm, that just aren't coming to me. Well, I'm okay. curious. I'm curious about that too. Just um, kind of the difference between writing um, drama versus comedy and that being more of a, a comedy show, mm -hmm. how does that get expressed in storyboarding? How do you write the show in that way? Uh, as far as the comedy goes? Yeah, yeah. Um, does it show up in a, in a visual gag? Does it show up in the writing? How does that? Well, I, I think as far as, um, uh, as being... Um, you know, being storyboard writers, um, so artists and writers, it it pushed us to try to create you know more visual gags than than the shows like, like The Simpsons, right? Simpsons is one of those typical um, shows. Well, it's not typical in any way, but it's a show that's created by uh, written by writers and then storyboarded by artists, and the artists certainly add to the the script, but um, it it's more um, it's less visual than it is um, uh, verbal, right? Yeah. Um, Phineas and Ferb, we were, there were a lot of gags that, that writers created, um, like the uh, <laughs> Mike Dietrich's uh, floating baby head, which was just absolutely <laughs> insanely brilliant. But I don't know if the writers would have come up with a floating baby head. And it was just a, you know, they were, we were doing a, I wasn't around at that time, but doing a uh, Halloween episode and, and um, you know, Mike was trying to draw one of the scariest things he'd ever, you know, thought of. And he came up with a floating baby head and Dan Pavenmeyer said, so uh, that's the scariest thing you've, you've, uh, you've ever seen or ever thought of. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as, as far as I heard the story. So that was, you know, that was brilliant. And it takes an artist to do that. You know, That's I really love, funny. 
I love it that they allowed the artist to have so much um, control or uh-huh. or opportunity. Opportunity is a much better word to to voice things out. You know, I think that uh, I'll, I'll give Disney this. There's a couple of shows that they put out that have had that good. It feels like that good conve- you know connection. Uh, Gravity Falls is one another one where the writing, yeah. I think, just and the art just took that into a whole nother level. I love yeah. this guy that you're drawing right now. This is <laughs> this is awesome. Oh, see, I had no idea where this was going to go, but it's um, it's yeah, that's kind of the fun of this stage of drawing is you don't know where it's going to go. So it's kind of so, like that old game where you'd be given a squiggle and you try to make something out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So does this allow you, when you do the shapes, does it allow you to actually give them more of a, a three-dimensional feel to it than, than just straight line drawing it? I don't know if it does. I, I think um, it's uh, because I'm always thinking about form. I mean, that just was instilled in me from the, the days of working at Disney feature animation. Um, but... Uh, I think there's, I think the shapes allow me to think more about the design of the character rather than jumping right into creating forms. I don't think I would have thought of this shape right here if I hadn't approached it this way. It, it's, it's, I, I enjoy this. This, is, this has been pretty, uh, it's got a nice feel to it. So um, let me ask another question for you, Eddie. Um, mm-hmm. Now you like most artists work from home mm-hmm. um, and you got two beautiful daughters mm-hmm. and a very sweet wife. How do you juggle? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm woefully um, inadequate in that, um, that part of this game, but um, it's, it's not easy. And, and um, you know, we're a family full of artists, so we, we don't have any executive skills. <laughs> I, I like how you say that we've got a few in my family too and uh it if somebody isn't uh, asking for a critique others are giving it and nobody's happy mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> so um where did red as the character come from well, was she inspired by one of your girls or was she inspired no no she really wasn't um um, she was nothing like uh, my kids. Um, I did how I did marry a redhead though, so it you know in that sense. Um, you um, understood the personality. <laughs> no, because her personality is very different than um, you know than my wife. So red red is more uh, personality wise. You know, I think at times she's she's kind of like what I wish I could be. She says the things I wish I could say. Okay. Um, um, but from a, uh, you know, she, I'm inspired by, she's not really, so she isn't anyone I know. Um, however, I think that uh, the character of Goose, who is um, um, the, uh, the, one of the kind of antagonists in the story, at least early on, who's this giant, um, uh, what would we call him, a felinoid um, um, kind of a, a park ranger of sorts who takes care of the planet and um, uh, he doesn't want other people on his planet. Um, he's definitely me. I mean, there's so much about <laughs> Goose. Me. He's, he's grumpy and, um, you know, uh, but I don't think we, um, I don't think, we we start to create characters and then we start to see personalities come into them. Um, uh, we might start being with the character being influenced by a certain person. Uh, but it's, but at some point all the characters are us, the creator. And, um, but they're also all unique in, in their own way. Do you, does that make sense? Well, all of our split personalities. Well, there's a, there's an there's an aspect of ourselves that are in all right. of our characters. We're ex, you know expressing something. Um, that, that isn't to say that they're all the same, but they all, um, you know, certainly uh, have. Um, oops, um, but they certainly are. 
um, aspects of our personality or our uh, our desire um, desires, right? Uh huh. I can definitely relate to that. I I feel like sometimes uh, I do have that little split personality where in my super siblings characters, the uh, the daughter says the things that I would never be brave enough to say, and the the older brother, you know is the voice of reason that you hear in your head sometimes. But then mm -hmm. the fun part is when you start hearing their voice and it's not your voice yes. anymore, mm -hmm. where that story suddenly really does come to life and they become people. I remember hearing Gary Trudeau talk about that when he was uh, doing, well, he's still doing Doonesbury, but in the early days of Doonesbury of how at some point the characters just become alive. And I think that's true for all of us. If we're lucky that the characters start to develop a certain uh, personality of their own. Um, and uh, that's great because then it's a matter of just taking different situations and, um, and kind of throwing them at those characters to see how they'll um, react to them. Yeah. All right. Shall we, shall we switch over to you, Patrick, for a little bit? Sure. Uh, all right. Thank you, Eddie. So sure. Let's so we'll we'll knock you out and switch to Patrick. Okay, let me try. See if this works. All right, there you go. All right, so um, it's just uh, trying to think of a little lizard alien dude. Um, Started out with kind of an under underlying sketch. I liked the idea of him having kind of a, a suit of some kind. And then um, just kind of let it kind of branch off from there. I decided to give him kind of a, uh, a uh, see a Cyclops eye and kind of an upturned Lord jaw kind of playing around with him. Love that. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, storytelling, you mentioned putting them in a situation. Um, what tips do you have for that, for finding inventive situations or different ways to, uh, different circumstances to put your characters in? That's, um, I think, you know, it's, it's really... Uh, the, the, the characters I think develop, because I want to back up on that just a little bit. Um, the, when you're developing characters, it's, it's really important to um, know who these characters are and um, to, to, because that's what character is, right? We can't separate physical character from, um, from the, uh, uh, the personality. The, uh, the, the interior character, what, what makes these people who they are. So, um, so a lot of my characters start by knowing what, um, what their story is, what their backstory, what their, um, you know, what, what motivates them, what their, what their needs are, what their desires are. And so, I think I could already start with a certain amount of, you know, situations built in for these characters. Um, when you're telling the story, it's a matter of showing those moments in their character that, um, that brings out um, and, and seeing how they react, right? Putting them in situations that reveal their character because that's what story does. It, conflict and story reveals the character. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good way to put it because you want to put them in a natural situation and then, I don't know, it's like some sort of catalyst to try to mm -hmm. get them to act at their best or worst nature, I guess, even. Yeah, it doesn't have to be their best um, because sometimes uh, acting badly reveals character. It doesn't mean that they have to stay there. Um, you know, they can redeem themselves, but... Um, they, they do have to respond to conflict 
and how they respond tells us a lot about who they are. I like the fact that if you're willing to create your characters, I call it in shades of gray in their mm-hmm. personality. It allows Are them you to... writing those kinds of stories, Travis? Oh, not, not, not 50 shades, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but having their personalities have shades because a lot of times people will write or create a story and the character is either black or white in their personality. There's no growth uh, of character. It's, it's, it reminds me of the great movie, The Great Race, which is one of my favorites where, where with uh, Tony Curtis and, uh, mm-hmm. And how, you know, Professor Fate was, you know, he's all dressed in black and Tony Curtis is all dressed in white, never gets dirty throughout the the whole movie. But I, I, and and it's yet as I look at stories and even as I create, I want to go, well, not everybody's going to be that perfect hero in white or that perfect bad guy. You know, the more complex you can create them, I think the more engaging the story actually will become and and the better the feel um, um, for it. And uh, I also, you know, I have another question. Uh, when you go into Red's Planet, um, have you ever been influenced by an iconic scene or an outside source and going, I want to put something similar within to that story? It just stood out like, a, like mm. something that you saw visually as a kid that you go, I, I, I've always wanted to pay homage to that in, in a way and do it subtly without people like realizing, oh, Oh, yeah. I, I do that all the time. I can't give you anything uh, uh, specific right offhand, but yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't ask for specific. <laughs> no, but it, yeah. And I, I throw in, there are little nods to everything that I've loved through my life, you know? Um, I do that all the time. I, I can't help it. Yeah. Um, like, I'm doing a story right now that uh, for Super Siblings, and um, it's it's all kinds of parodies. It's a parody on a vacation the family took. It's a parody on Jurassic Park. I mean, I have all kinds of stuff I always throw in there because I just can't help it. Mm-hmm. I have a, uh, a car chase in the, uh, in the beginning of uh, Red's Planet book one between um, a local sheriff, you know, small town sheriff and um, a UFO. And that was, you know, very much uh, inspired by scenes in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Now you mention it, I can see that. Uh, yeah. That was so well drawn, too. I've always enjoyed that sequence in the first book. Oh, thanks. It was, it was a blast. So, as you're finishing up Red, mm-hmm. and, you know, and I know you've got... You're working on it and, and stuff. Do you have any thoughts of what you want to do after Red? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you put a lot of years into Red. Yeah, actually, it's. Um, I didn't even celebrate the uh, the anniversary, but we just came in January. It was the tenth anniversary of of me first putting it online um, and start starting the story from chapter one online, and there were. 10 years prior to that of me working on ideas, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's time to, to step back and I'm not sure what my, um, I, I'm not sure what's next. Um, making money for one thing. That's something you don't do <laughs> as an author. So um, how, how many, how many pages does that represent 10 years for you? <laughs> not as many as it should. Um, you know, when it stopped being, I, I'm, I've always regretted that it stopped being a, a web comic um, for several reasons. Um, I miss the, the connecting directly with my audience and um, knowing that there are people out there reading it. When you, when you publish a book, you don't, you don't know that. Um, you don't get to talk to them and there are actual there are federal laws that keep me from having conversations with um with my audience if they're under 13 um <laughs> so um the coppa laws have um you know uh, kept me from keeping having comments on my uh on my website and so um so i miss that i miss that part um and I think I probably would have been further along if I'd had that um, going. And I mean, Patrick, you, you understand this, you know, web comics are, 
you know, the web comics are probably the closest we get as cartoonists to performing live, uh, it, excluding caricature, which I wouldn't wish on anyone. Um, Amen. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and there are a lot of people who love it, but it, you know, they um, can love it. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a hard gig. Um, but um, doing a web comic and you know posting it, and then within minutes you have someone. Uh, commenting um, about your comic and that's awesome you know doing a, a daily now has been a an oh, eye an eye yeah. opening revelation to me yeah yeah and and all of a sudden you know uh, and, and like you i i respond as i see fit but i'm careful on my responses mm -hmm. but at the same time everybody instantly has an opinion oh, and the yeah. bigger the comic gets, the more opinions, you know, the purists mm -hmm. come out and then the non purists come out. And I, I kind of think that my whole main goal is to make sure if my mom can laugh at the comic or at least get it, even though she might not understand it, then I'm on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, That's I look saying at something for D and D very much so. But <laughs> as, as you look at it though, over the years, you know, web comics, I think, really opened the doors for independent creators in a way that had never been opened before. Mm -hmm. And it allowed us an instant audience all over the world. Yeah. Um, whereas instead, and, and you've worked in both realms, I've worked in both realms, when you're dealing with a publisher, and I'm not saying that it's bad or anything, I find that though you get very limited uh, sometimes on what you can do to, to get the thing out there especially if they're not completely married to your project, they're just publishing it or whatever it might be. Yep. And so I, I really enjoy the, the web comic aspect. I, I, I still, you know, life of the party could very easily be taken, picked up or, or go in another direction, but I just have no desire at the moment. I like the engagement mm -hmm. that I have with the fan base, which I could have never had before if I was doing anything else. Mm-hmm. Even with Bean, you know, and Bean's in a holding pattern at the moment as we look at, uh, at a publisher right now. But, you know, a lot of it is, is it's just been an interesting ride. Uh, and the other thing is that I've noticed is you can't hide behind a table anymore or behind your publisher like you used to. You used to be able to hide behind a publisher and say, oh, okay, you know, that, you know, like at a convention or such now, because they, you inter have that interaction with fans with web comics, I find that they feel that they are much more, uh, quote, connected to you or want to be connected mm -hmm. to you at a show. Nothing wrong with it. It's just there's a lot more interaction. Yeah, it's building that relationship with your audience and uh, not having a middleman anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing and a curse, right? That's looking good, Patrick. Thanks. So uh, you want to jump take, back in? Jump back in, Travis. All right. I'll jump back in. Pretty sure. And that, you know, is another question about uh, creating stories is um, finding an audience for your stories. Um, I've definitely yeah. gone back and forth between web comics, self-published comics and published comics and stories and uh, all with different levels of success, obviously. But, um, you know, what's the secret sauce, you guys, for building your audience? Um, that's an interesting question in there because I don't think there is a, a, a secret sauce sometimes. I, I think there are story killers. Uh, if I was to write the story that I think I, you wanted to hear, so I'm like, oh, everybody's going to read this. This is such a great story. I've missed the point because those are the books that don't usually go well. But if I write the story that I wanted as a kid that I enjoyed, the audience finds it. And I think those are a lot more appreciated because you can really see the creator's love for what they're doing. I think there's, I think there's truth in that. Um, there's something though that's, um, that you have to remember. And I, because I, uh, George Lucas gets brought up a lot when this point is made that you should create for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but um 
there is uh, a certain point that you're going to have to understand that um, that's not always um, the key to success. You may create something that no one else resonates with, and that's the risk you take. There is a risk, right? Oh, very um, much so. Um, and I think people a lot of times hear that and think, well, that's, I'm creating something for myself, so someone will love it. And yeah, that may, someone will love it. But that may, it may be one, someone. And, Your mom. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, and that's always a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something you have to, to remember that, that you may not find a large audience. Um, so. Um, and are you content with that too? That could be the other thing. Are you content with having a small audience doing mm -hmm. what you want to do or you know, do you need a bigger, if you want a bigger audience, are you willing to change and look at some more formulaic processes? Well, there's no guarantee that even that would, will work. It's, it's always, I think the, you know, the, just you create with a sense of, um, of honesty, right? You, right. You, and, um, and then recognize that uh, it may land and it may not, and just enjoy the ride. I think yeah. that's really important to, uh, to to come from an area where, you know, you're doing it because you love it. And a little bit to Travis's point that I at least have to like the story I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what do you, what do you think about, um, we all work, I think in all ages material. So uh, what is it that has the best chance of mass appeal? Is it just making it family friendly, but how do you make something entertaining and family friendly? That's, um, I, I don't think about, I don't think about that. Um, I think about, um, obviously there are certain guidelines. I'm, um, you know, what the things you can say in something that's family friendly. Um, but I guess my influence, so many of my influences are of that, um, of that genre, um, that, that it isn't something I have to think that hard about when I'm creating. Um, I just try to uh, create something I want to see mm -hmm. and, and the things I want to see are usually those things, right? I, I, I tell everybody that, that this is my Pixar film. This, if I had the chance to direct a movie, this would be the movie I would direct. Um, I'd so, pay to see it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you um so um oh too bad we don't have movie theaters these days um <laughs> just one just day missed the boat on that one yes yeah, like, <laughs> but i think it's you know i'm i'm just i'm not creating something i don't think of it as family friendly as much as family accessible does that make sense i think that yeah. makes perfect yeah yeah I like that because, you know, like Pixar, um, there is that maybe stigma that, oh, if it's family friendly, that means it's not going to be funny or it's going to be stupid or, but actually their, mm -hmm. their films are very intelligent and have very deep storylines and well, uh, are entertaining all at the same time. If you look mm -hmm. at some of the graphic novels that are out there that are very kid centric or they quote family you know and i'm gonna do bone again i mean they talk about that's in a lot of schools and a lot of elementary schools and stuff but the themes that jeff uses are, are very deep well yeah jeff didn't create that for uh, uh for kids he created it for himself it was never a kid's story it was um it was scholastic that turned it into or it's, talked him into you know let's make this a kid's book but it's it's a fantastic read and i think that that jeff actually kind of opened the doors for a lot of uh creators comic creators to to do stories that like that showed that you could do it and have a successful story yeah i think so you know he's he was one of my favorite influences as well so i'm gonna put some stars in the background so in case if i decide to go back and ink these <laughs> <laughs> um how about this what what do you do when your story hits hits a corner or hits a hits a wall and you don't know how to solve it you don't know where to take the story how to get the characters out of a jam whatever it is what uh, what do you do to overcome that 
Boy, that's a great one. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really, um, uh, you, you've, you've got to think, um, you got to, you got to walk away from it. I, I think you've, you've got to stop thinking about, um, uh, you got to stop thinking the, in the normal way. I'm trying to, th I'm, I'm drawing and talking at the same time, which is always dangerous guys. Um, <laughs> That's why we do there, it this way. <laughs> yeah, there, I, there are laws in like, uh, <laughs> like uh, thir 37 states against this, but I'm going <laughs> to. So um, I think you really need to go to something that's so completely different. I know one thing they used to do at Pixar and I, I don't know if they still do it. And this was, you know, back in the early days, they would always go to Miyazaki. Oh and, yeah. And they, and I mean, not literally to Miyazaki. No, 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 no. They went to his movies. Mm -hmm. um, although that, you know, many of them knew Miyazaki, but they would go and, watch one of his movies and and i love that because his movies are so they're there's they're so different than how we think in the western world um he approaches stories so differently um so he's he's not beholden to the um the same old um uh, cliches that 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 we would automatically go to so that's a that's a good thing to do to break out of the box is just to think about um, uh, or, or go and look at something that's so different than what you're doing um, that you're forced to come back and look at your story in a completely different way. Now, now that you brought him up, who's, mm -hmm. what's your favorite uh, movie that he created? I don't, I don't know if I have one. I'm a, I'm a great admirer of his, I'm, mm -hmm. but I'm, I I wouldn't call myself a, a fan. So I, cause I, I just don't know the films as well, but I mean, Totoro is beautiful. Oh yeah. Um, there's so much heart and the, the moments in Totoro are amazing, but I find something um, in just about all of them. Um, the, um, oh, what's the one with the, the floating city? Uh, is that Laputa, uh, Castle in the Sky? Castle in the Sky. Amazing film. It's just such a, I, I don't know. And even the, the last one he did about the, um, uh, the, the airplane was absolutely, was that the last one or did he do another one? Was I think that, his studio did one. I don't remember. Well, I think the last film he directed was the one about the, uh, the airplane that designer right. at, uh, what Mitsubishi and, um, it was absolutely gorgeous. So. The very, very cool. So what were your, uh, and uh, we can move on to, to your screen now. I, I'm oh, about almost done with this. I think everybody might get um, disappointed of where I've come here. Oh, no, no, no. I don't think so. Because we're all different artists. And that's what the, uh, the kids enjoy. You know, what I draw. Okay. And, how, and so it's all good. See, I'm a scene drawer. Yeah. So, so I'm going to stop. We'll jump back into you. All right. Um, so, um, just I'm, I'm struggling just so the audience knows. Um, I'm struggling with uh, the CPU, so um, we're a little choppy. <laughs> that's a uh, that's just uh, code for <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but better looking, you're like a vintage wine, not moldy cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so here I am. I'm, I'm I'm just trying to you know do something with this guy here now. Now is he going to end up in red? <laughs> oh, I I don't know. He's pretty uh, awesome. I like him. He's. Uh, I love the cr crosshatch on the nose. Yeah, something I've done um, before with um, um, with one of my characters. Um, I have a. Uh, um, yep, yeah, there I go. I've got the little spinny wheel now. So um, I've got a uh, kind of a. Um, um, oh. My gosh, I just forgot what the uh, animal was. My uh, my agent loves this animal. The um, it's not a groundhog. It's a um, is it a platypus wombat. No, a wombat. Thank you. <laughs> so he's he's um, so I've got this wombat character. Okay, why am I not getting? Oh, I'm coloring. Where you're coloring oh. on the wrong layer. I'm coloring on the wrong layer. I've got to put through. There we go. <laughs> through. Um. So yeah, I started doing that on his nose and um, 
which you know is is uh, honestly straight out of uh, Walt Kelly. It's what he used to do on uh, Albert the Alligator's nose. So, so a little cross hatching. Yeah. Uh-huh. So who do you think would be one of your biggest influences besides it might Kelly? Be, might be Walt Kelly. Um, might be. It looks like it could him, be Walt Kelly. I'm, I brought him up so many times. Um, well, I mean, not, as a kid, when you were growing up, you oh, know, yeah. for me, it was Rankin Bass. Oh, you know, yeah. When yeah. I saw The Hobbit, I, I, all of a sudden, fantasy was my, my yeah. ooh, that's what I loved. Well, I'm the, genera- I'm the, uh, the Charles Schultz generation, right? And, mm-hmm. and when I read the, uh, the biography that, that we weren't supposed to read, um, from, um, I, I realized why. Um, he had, um, no one had ever had a, a marketing deal like that before. And it was just everywhere. Um, so in 1970, when I was you know, about five years old, uh, there's peanuts merchandise everywhere. There's, you know, animated TV shows, there's notebooks. And I remember being in third grade and having, you know, one of the little paperbacks and um, learning how to draw Snoopy. And I still have drawings, you know, of, of some original characters that I did, but they were Snoopy. Um, so that, he was probably the first. Um, and then of course, Disney. Disney was still pretty you know the wonderful world of disney was still every uh um every uh sunday night and you know that was a great there was the one artist uh, channel five i don't know if you remember him the popeye um well yeah. i did what did you you guys had like one of the what what uh, like one of the local shows there no no he would uh he would uh i can't remember it was tom something tom Patton, i think is his name and he'd draw, you know, and, and run cartoons during the time, you know, that he was talking. And this was like right at seven o'clock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I can remember that. And There was like Little Rascals in the morning. And then right after that was him and Popeye. And, mm-hmm. and then they'd show like, oh, what was it? Like Tom Slick and mm-hmm. Super Chicken. Super Chicken. I can't remember what, who was the studio that did those? Uh, it was... Um... Uh, Jay Ward, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, you were talking about influences. Uh, for me, it was always uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, yeah. That that <laughs> strip was just absolutely my favorite. Um, in terms of just imagination and illustration, everything. I just loved that he took the format and then expanded it. And then oh. Calvin was so just... Uh, devious i just loved it that's such a great image here ed oh i love this yeah, i'm not so sure about it but thanks um no no I just it's like, like a deranged easter bunny that not i mean uh, oh my gosh <laughs> great <laughs> guess, guess what no no now i've got to go back i've got to start inking again here um this is this is what um this is what i've got to do it just it has to happen now <laughs> <laughs> yes. See now that there it is. That just enhanced it even more. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it's these, so much for uh, for aliens, right? No, that works. <laughs> that works. He's got that long that long tail. Reminds me of uh, you know we talk about influences, and I look at Berkeley Breath as as one of my influences. I've always loved Bloom County and and yeah. the whole long haired or long tailed hamster. well it's so here's what we've got to do though on that tail um oops what happened there oh it's a vector that's right um now you draw with vectors a lot don't you (laughs) i i do and the reason is um this right here see how quickly i just erased that line oh wow um it's that's the great thing about the vector on clip studio paint is i can it's, Clip Studio paints weird. I think they put in vector because it's it takes up less um, storage space, right? Right. Than a but you can't output vector, which is just kind of crazy. Um, but uh, what I did was uh, what I I do it because I can manipulate the line later, or I can quickly go and uh, erase it. So I think. Um, 
I didn't mean for that to be transparent, but yeah, so we get kind of a, a, a uh, an alien bunny. So, because, you know, aliens can be just about anything. They don't have to be, um, uh, they don't have to be, let's see. Now, I have also noticed you love layers. Um, I do love layers because I like to have um, um, the ability to go back and correct things. So this is awesome. Um, it's interesting because it's for me. It's like a hybrid between uh, drawing an illustrator and Photoshop. I yeah. I usually pick one or the other depending on what I'm going to do. But mm -hmm. this is an interesting way of combining both attributes, being able to color like Photoshop but then having the ability to control your lines afterward, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you look at it, both Eddie and I are Clip Studio Paint users and you're Procreate. So. Yeah. So I, I see what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I like Procreate too. Don't get me wrong. I, I do like Procreate. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Well, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a necessity. You know, I, I would be doing a lot more in clip uh, if I was using a tablet connected to my desktop. Well, do you need to, should we switch to you real quick and then? Sure. We can. I like this Easter theme popping up here. <laughs> nice. I love it. I think he needs so to have some I've, spots though. I've got to relinquish uh, control here first, don't I? Okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. So what kind of, um, what counsel would you give young writers and artists um, that want to pursue this? Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, what I used to. Tell? Oh, I used to say just keep going. Now I say run. Um, <laughs> it's the other direction. Is that yeah, what you're how quickly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that will change. Um, I, you know, do it because you love it. Do it because it's something you want to do. Don't do it because. Um, because some guy you heard of, um, whether it's um, uh, Walt Disney or, um, or uh, um, you know, um, Eddie Pittman, Bill, Bill Waterson. No, no, I'm not in this group. <laughs> or Raina Telgemeier made a lot of money. Um, <laughs> do it because it's something you want to do. Um, you know, you, 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 because it's, it is a tough road sometimes. Now, there's a lot of money to be made in art and um, but not always in creating your own stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's tough. You've got to find an audience. Travis, you've done a great job of finding an audience and cultivating an audience. Um, but um, yeah, that's 25 years. Yes. Yeah. But um, when you're working uh, for a publisher, um, it's not always as easy. I'm, I'm actually very restricted in some of the things I can do to connect with, with fans. Um, some of the things you do, uh, Travis, like uh, having an email list, I can't do because uh, I'm a children's author. Um, it's, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, now, but, is that mainly because of your publisher or is it because of... No, it's, it's, the, it's COPPA. It's the federal... Oh, that's I, right. I, I can't run the risk of uh, someone under 13 signing up for my newsletter. So, um, And I don't I even use my newsletter much anymore. Yeah. But, but having that list so you can connect to people. But I want to go back to what the question was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so learn everything you can about story. Learn everything you can about um, creating uh, compelling stories and writing. Learn how to draw. Learn how to draw everything, not just cartoon characters. Um, I, I teach a, a lot of college courses, and it's amazing how many people come into college wanting to be in animation, but they can't draw. They never, they never learned how to draw. And it's easier now to learn how to draw than ever before. Um, you've got internet full of uh, art tutorials. Right now during the, uh, uh, the fun little um, you know, stay at home crisis that we have, everybody has come out of the woodwork doing tutorials. Um, it's fantastic. I'm learning stuff. I'm learning I've been drawing wrong the whole time. So um, thanks to... Uh, <laughs> People like Aaron Blaze and uh, <laughs> you, know. you know what a great comment about seeing all these creators come out. For me, it's just emphasizes that there is no correct way to do good art. 
everybody's got these unique little tweaks and talents and stuff. I mean, you have your basic setups that yeah. and guidelines, but for the most part, people approach things so uniquely and differently. That's true, but there there are um, there are some common things that are mm-hmm. Im- important, and um, so. But yes, everybody has their own take on them, and once you learn the rules, you you can learn to, you can break them, right? Oh, very much so. But you got to learn those rules first. Yeah, I still struggle with hands; they drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of people um, use that. Um, I agree with you that everybody has their own way of doing things. But I think a lot of times people go, uh, you know, someone looks at their work and goes, "Yeah, you know, you need to work on um, hands and feet," and they go, "Yeah, well, it's just my style." So <laughs> no, no, there has to be a realization that that. You, you have to improve or work on or keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. I, I think if it's easy to go, yeah, it's my style and get stuck in a rut where you're not really, there's no improvement or growth. Mm-hmm. And, and for, as a creator, I find that to be dangerous. I, I want to always be challenging. So I'll look at stuff and go, I need to fix this, or I need to change this, or I need to, to how do I improve or how do I improve my pacing or whatever? And if you can keep growing, then your style, I think, gets stronger and stronger. Mm-hmm. That's a great, I like his eye. Thanks. And his fangs. <laughs> yeah, his upturned jaw just made me feel like he needed a serious underbite. So. <laughs> well, perfect. I think... Uh, we uh, might be getting to a point where we could uh, ask one of my favorite questions of our guests. Yep. Um, so what, I, what I've started doing is asking the same question of everybody. And the question is, why do you create art? What's your why? That's a, that's a good question. Um, um, it, it's, I don't know. It's, 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 I have to, right? I mean, I just don't, it's like breathing. Um, I, I can go for a while. I can hold my breath, right? I can go without creating for a while, but um, at some point I'm going to have to have to breathe. And at some point I'm going to have to create something. So it, to me, it's just something that is so much a part of me um, that I, I don't know if I can uh, say exactly why I create. What a great answer. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a cop-out, but... Um... No, no. Because I think, uh, you know, the longer you do it, it just becomes an integral... It's like like you said, breathing. You can hold your breath for a while, but you just still have that desire and need to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I agree 100% with that. Yeah, it's, it's just... Uh, it's like an itch that uh, I have to scratch. Yeah. So, well, thank you, Ed. We really appreciated you coming on with us today. This has it was been, a, it was a blast. You know, I, I think that our fans are, are these young people and old people alike, or, you know, I think they enjoy getting to see. But not the middle-aged people. No, you not the middle-aged. Just... That's my group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'll be 50 next year. But. Uh, oh, poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow i'm actually the youngest in the group i love it <laughs> yeah when you when you guys brought up that bill watterson was your you know reading his stuff when you're young and i'm going yeah i was in college um <laughs> <laughs> i can remember when it came out <laughs> you used to clip the newspaper clippings oh yeah What's i still have paper <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> so um, where can we find Red's Planet? Where can people get your work? Because that's what we want to promote. We want to promote Red's a great book. I've read it. I've really enjoyed it. I, I got to even help a little bit on it. Which Yes, I you was- did. You did some beautiful work on it. Um, the um, uh, Well, it's available in wherever you get your, your books. It's not... Uh, it's, it's no longer in the bookstores, but whatever online bookstore you use, um, you can get it there. And uh, do you have a, a place where they can see what you do too, or? Um, yeah, you can. Um, yeah, the website's down currently, um, uh, redsplanet.com, but um, you can 
I post uh, uh, stuff on Instagram occasionally on both Eddie Pittman and Red's Planet. So they, usually all the social media is under Red's Planet or um, uh, Eddie Pittman. That's awesome. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I uh, hope you had fun drawing aliens with us today. Or bunnies. So, or bunnies. <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You, you want to see how this guy turned out real quick? Yeah, we I do. would love we do. to see. I, we, I, I definitely. Just, I probably isn't much. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it's, that's a great. That would be a great image. To... <laughs> so there he is. That's, there he oh, is. he's yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I... I have no plans of having him in, but I tell you, I will at least make him a background character in Red's Planet 3. So he will <laughs> be there somewhere. Well, so. I think he's the, the Easter Bunny that shows up to uh, steal your your treats in your basket. I, yeah, probably. <laughs> and I think what I need to do is have another little alien here um, that's just a, a, little, a little carrot, right? That, that can... <laughs> run away so, yeah. <laughs> that's perfect well, well you so know we'll, the best the best we'll thing about like him I, I almost want to name him like clyde <laughs> <laughs> yeah he is, he's very much a clyde yes <laughs> well that's awesome patrick you got anything else for our fans or anybody else um no this has been awesome and uh i think i think we need to have eddie back on many times this has been great that would be a blast thanks for having me i love you yeah and uh Let's see, uh, Travis, uh, what's your website? Um, beanleafpress.com, which is probably going to go uh, under a, a, an overhaul soon. Uh, but <laughs> I do more on, on Facebook or Instagram just under Travis Hansen or Travis okay. Bean. So, and if you just do Life of the Party, you'll find the fan page. Awesome. And I guess for me, it's uh, uh, patrickscullen.com and then supersiblingscomics.com. So... Uh, Great. It's been a treat chatting with you guys and we'll do it again soon. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hold on after he hits when we turn it off. Just hold on one sec.